The 2021 Honda Ridgeline is the ultimate pragmatist's pickup truck. This is about the same size as the Tacoma, the Colorado, the Canyon, the Ranger, etc. But this is definitely different because this is a unibody vehicle, not a body on frame pickup truck. The close relative to this is the Honda Pilot. And previous generations of the Ridgeline were derided for looking a little bit too much like the Pilot and the closely related Odyssey. But honestly, this is 99% of what mid sized truck shoppers in America actually need if they're willing to look past the logo and past the fact that this is a unibody vehicle. Before I get flooded with angry tweets, clearly there are reasons you might want to take a look at a competitive body on frame pickup truck, mainly to do with towing and off-road ability. But there are also areas where the Ridgeline excels over any of the competition, mainly in road manners, handling ability, and I think interior comfort as well. For 2021, Honda has solved one of the complaints about the Ridgeline of the past, the front end design. They've certainly made this look more aggressive. This particular one has the HPD package on it, so we get a unique grill. The regular one is a little bit more Honda-like with its horizontal slats. We have partial LED headlights, LED low beams, and then we have halogen high beams up here. I'm happy to say that for this review, Honda has sent me one of the lower end trims of the Ridgeline, and this is where I think the Ridgeline is really at its best in terms of value, because we now have standard all-wheel drive. Being based on the same platform as the Pilot and the Odyssey is really an advantage for the Ridgeline, because this vehicle is actually a little bit wider than the average mid-sized truck in America, about four inches wider overall than the Toyota Tacoma. That gives us not only more room on the inside, but also a wider cargo area in the back. At 210.2 inches long, the Ridgeline is the longest Honda currently on sale in North America, but it is on the small side for the mid-sized truck segment. The shortest version of the Tacoma is about 2 inches longer than this, and the longest version is about 15 inches longer. Versus most of the competition, the Ridgeline will give you a more spacious cab than the largest cab available in those competitors, and a bed that is a little bit bigger than the base bed available. This is a 64-inch bed, and it's a little bit wider than normal because this is about 4 inches wider than the Tacoma, but it's not quite as long as the longest beds available in those other trucks. Most of the trucks out there will give you a 72-73-inch to 73 inch bed available. One of the big benefits to the Ridgeline's unibody design is a low step in height. The floor in the Ridgeline is closer to the ground because there's no frame in the way. Having the frame and the body integrated into one piece makes it more space efficient. Now, the Ridgeline does have less ground clearance than a lot of the competitors out there, but the difference is not huge. It's only about half an inch. And when you take a look at approach, departure, and breakover angles, the approach angle is actually better than some of GM's small pickup trucks, and the breakover and departure angles are almost identical to the Colorado and Canyon. In addition to the unique grill up front, the HPD package has the graphics right over here on this side, and then the unique wheels and tires that you see here. Moving to the rear, we find pretty typical pickup styling, tail lamps that are just on the sides, dual exhaust tips at the bottom, two inch hitch receiver in the middle. This tailgate is not damped. That is one complaint that I have, and it is a little on the heavy side. However, it has a trick up its sleeve, and that is that it opens to the side right like a big door. Now this does not have a mechanism to hold it in place. That is one complaint that I have. So if you're on a hillside, you may end up finding yourself sort of cut in half by this door. But I find it a little bit more useful than the barn door setup that we have on the Ram 1500, because there's nowhere in this door for gravel or things like that to fall in there and get stuck in the mechanism. That's one worry that I have with that Dodge Ram. The one downside is this module right here. You could fit even wider things in the bed if we didn't have this latch mechanism for the tailgate sitting in this exact way. According to Honda, the Ridgeline gives us the highest standard payload rating in this segment, but it is a game of semantics. You will find slightly higher payload ratings in some of the competition, but they won't be standard. They will be optional. 1,583 pounds is what the Ridgeline will do maximum, and this one is actually pretty high at 1,543, definitely higher than the last Tacoma that I had. Towing, however, is on the low end of the segment at 5,000 pounds maximum. All trim levels of the Ridgeline come standard with Honda Sensing. That includes radar adaptive cruise control, autonomous emergency braking, lane keeping assistance, and lane departure warning. Also available, but not on this model, is blind spot warning with rear cross traffic detection, and oddly enough, no parking sensors on this model either, although we have a backup camera. The Ridgeline's relatively compact hood is made possible by the engine orientation. This engine is sitting across the engine bay rather than longitudinally mounted like we find in every other truck in North America. This is a 3.5 liter V6 basically shared with the Honda Pilot. It produces 280 horsepower and 262 pound-feet of torque. Also essentially shared with the Honda Pilot is the 9-speed automatic transmission and the standard torque vectoring all-wheel drive system. 
The standard all-wheel drive system means that fuel economy is going to come in a little bit below some of the competition's base models, but remember, all-wheel drive is standard on the Ridgeline. And it is more of an all-wheel drive system than a four-wheel drive system in the traditional sense because this is a torque vectoring clutch-based system. So it can engage a clutch, send power to the rear. If the clutch is not engaged, most of the power goes to the front. But this system can send up to 70% of engine power to the rear axle, and then, an interesting twist, it can send all of that power to a single rear wheel. This is the only truck in North America with a torque vectoring rear axle. The electronically controlled rear differential can act as a limited slip differential in slippery situations, but it can also send power exclusively to one wheel or the other to help improve handling. I found front seat comfort to be excellent in the Ridgeline, even though this model does not have the power driver's seat. It also doesn't have adjustable lumbar support. Really, that's the only thing that I wish they would add to this base seat design. We have a manual tilt telescopic steering column with a large range of motion as well. In addition to the seat being more comfortable than most of the competition, the seating position is certainly more comfortable than we find in the Tacoma because the seat is much more upright. It feels like I'm sitting in a truck, honestly, and the Tacoma, the seating position is really relaxed. It feels like I have my arms and my legs sticking straight out in front of me. My only complaint about this interior is that the parking brake is not an electronic parking brake. We have a lever right there, and for some people, that may end up hitting you in your left shin. Honda says that the Ridgeline has the roomiest cab in this segment. You will find options with a little bit more legroom, however. If I move over to the right side with this front seat all the way back in its tracks, I have about an inch and a half of legroom left. Headroom is very, very generous back here. I have about two inches of headroom left. You can likely thank the unibody design here. Again, the Ridgeline is very space efficient because we don't have that frame taking up space. So the cab is certainly taller than the cab that we find in the Tacoma and notably wider. This is at least four inches wider in the back than the Tacoma. So if you're looking at a mid-size pickup truck and you're thinking, gosh, that rear seat is just a little bit too tight for, say, adults and child seats combined, so you wanted to put one child seat right here in the middle and put adults on each side, it is going to be an awful lot easier in the Ridgeline because this back seat is considerably wider. It's basically the same width as the one in the Pilot. You'll really notice that if, for instance, you fold down the center armrest because this center armrest in the rear is almost as wide as the one in a full-size truck. As we see in other trucks, the seat bottom cushion folds up to give us more cargo space inside. We don't have a completely flat load floor, but it is really close. Really just this mounting point for the bar that latches the bottom seat cushion in place is there. This tailgate design makes it easy to reach in and grab cargo that has slid forward. Also makes it easier to bring a forklift in and drop something in the bed if you need to as well. The bed itself is a composite bed, so it's not a metal bed. You don't need a liner because it's already plastic from the start. And then we have one more trick up its sleeve. We have an extra trunk in here. The in-floor trunk gives us 7.4 cubic feet of additional storage space, and it is the source of my only complaint in the Ridgeline, and that is this is where you find a temporary spare tire, not a full-size spare. But clearly, when it comes to my exclusive trunk comfort index, the Ridgeline has to get 10 out of 10 points, and I suspect this might actually be possible. Let's see, there's no, uh, no helper handle to help you close the trunk lid, however. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that this is the Sport Trim Ridgeline, so this is theoretically the base model with a few options added to it. We have height adjustable shoulder belts and height adjustable headrests. The bulk of this interior is shared with the Honda Pilot, including the general design of the front seats. We have separate armrests for the driver and front passenger right there integrated into the seats. The door panels are very similar to what we see in the Honda Pilot as well, with a lot of storage cubbies going on down there at the bottom of the door. We have a trim strip separating the hard plastics on the lower side and the soft touch injection molded upper section of that dashboard. The glove compartment is a bin style compartment. I was not able to fit a large tablet computer inside, although some smaller ones might fit. In the middle of the dashboard, we have a touchscreen infotainment system. This is not running the latest version of Honda's infotainment software, but it does support smartphone integration as you can see here. We have a physical power and volume knob right there, and if we go to the Honda main menu, you'll notice that this is pretty closely related to what we find in the Honda Civic in terms of software, so definitely not as modern as what we see in the Accord and the Odyssey. Below that, we have a tri-zone automatic climate control system. That's a pretty unique feature as far as mid-size trucks go. A rather strange twist, however, we don't actually have rear controls for the rear climate control zone. There's a button right here so you can control that rear climate control zone, but no buttons back there for the rear passengers to do it. Below that, we find a USB input, power outlet, there's an available Qi wireless charging mat, but this model does not have it. We find Honda's Hunt and Peck shifter design right here in the center console. This is a drive mode selector switch, normal snow, mud, and sand are the modes, a button to disable the auto start stop system, two very large cup holders, and then a center console that is shared with the Honda Pilot as well. It has a roller style cargo cover there. 
And if I open it up, we have a very, very large storage cubby that's enabled by the fact that this is, again, a unibody vehicle. So there's a lot of space efficiency going on. The instrument cluster features three physical dials, an LED digital speedometer up top, and then a small multifunction LCD in the middle. The sport trim has a four-spoke urethane steering wheel, but we still have paddle shifters on the back, which is a really nice touch. This is one of the few pickup trucks in North America of any description that actually has paddle shifters. On the right side of the steering wheel, we have the controls for the standard radar adaptive cruise control system, also some trip computer buttons right there, buttons for the phone, voice command, and then buttons that control the infotainment system. Towing with the Ridgeline is very much like towing with a unibody SUV or crossover, say a V6 Dodge Durango. There's certainly some pros and cons to that, but let's talk about the pros first. The first one is traction. This has, again, a standard all-wheel drive system. So if I floor it right here on this uphill section, we get instant traction. You don't have to engage a part-time four-wheel drive system like you'd find in any of the competitive pickup trucks. It's important to remember that part-time four-wheel drive systems are not designed to operate on regular pavement, including regular pavement in the rain. That's actually one common misconception that I've noticed out there. If you're in a Tundra or a Tacoma or a Ram or Silverado or any other pickup truck out there with a part-time four-wheel drive system, please don't put it in four high in the rain. That actually will decrease your stability and your traction because it's gonna lock the center coupling and the front and rear differentials need to be able to spin at different rates in order to go around a corner, even in the rain, even in the snow, even on the ice. You really only wanna use those four-wheel drive systems where you need extra traction in a straight line. Hence, quite logically, the name part-time four-wheel drive. But this system is always on. So this is gonna feel much more sure-footed in the snow, in the rain, uh, on ice, etc., than those part-time four-wheel drive systems. It also is gonna turn pretty tight, definitely tighter than a half-ton truck. And it's something that I noticed out on some of these winding roads up here. That's one of the reasons that I prefer towing with something like the Durango than a full-size truck is the size of the vehicle. And at 210 inches long, this is certainly shorter than the longest versions of the Tacoma or the other competition. You'll definitely notice the extra traction that this all-wheel drive system gives you if you simply crank the wheel and floor it from one side to the other. Now we do get a little bit of torque steer like you might find in a front-wheel drive vehicle on occasion, but it's very well controlled thanks to the torque vectoring ability of this all-wheel drive system. The trailer that I have connected to the Ridgeline at the moment weighs about 3,500 pounds. I think this is a pretty common weight for people to be towing around if you have a small boat or a box trailer utility trailer like this or a small flatbed for moving around a small garden tractor, etc. These are the kind of weights that people can easily move around with a pickup truck with a 5,000 pound weight capacity. Remember that depending on the options that you select on this or competitive pickup trucks, towing ratings actually may end up quite similar to the body on frame competition. The last Tacoma, for instance, that I reviewed here at Alex and Autos had a payload rating of just 1,000 pounds. The payload rating on this vehicle is over 500 pounds higher. And that means that if you put four people in this pickup truck, it can tow more than that Tacoma could. Remember that towing ability is more than simple drivetrain design, engine layout, rear wheel drive, front wheel drive, etc. Payload capacity has a lot of impact on that because you need to put 10 to 15% of the weight of your trailer on the tongue, and that will limit your payload and towing capacity if you start putting extra people in the cabin. Now, in terms of zero to 60 acceleration time, this model went zero to 60 in 6.9 seconds. That's definitely respectable for a small truck like this. Interestingly enough, that was actually a little bit slower than the last model I tested with Honda's in-house developed six-speed automatic. I'm not entirely clear why that is because this transmission has a more aggressive starting ratio. This ended up also a little bit slower than some of the other Honda vehicles with the same engine and transmission combination on them. In my 6-0 braking test, it took 130 feet for this vehicle to stop from 60 miles an hour back to zero. That's pretty comparable to the last time I tested it, and pretty comparable, honestly, to most pickup trucks, either mid-sized trucks or full-size trucks. The one thing that's not comparable, however, is the way the Ridgeline handles. When you don't have a trailer connected to the back of it, the Ridgeline is an awful lot of fun. This is quite simply the best handling truck that we currently have on sale in the United States. The torque vectoring rear axle is extremely noticeable out in your favorite winding mountain road. If you drive this a little bit harder in the corners, it has a very predictable nature to it, excellent grip, excellent handling ability as well. This quite simply feels considerably more sorted than any body on frame pickup truck that we currently have in the US. Even some of the excellent handling half-ton trucks don't feel quite as nimble or as agile as this. Obviously, some of that has to do with the size, but a lot of it has to do with the way this drivetrain is designed. The Ridgeline not only has a lower center of gravity, which helps improve handling, it also has a fully independent rear suspension. And you'll certainly notice that if you get this out on rough or pavement, because the rear suspension is definitely a lot more composed. Solid rear axles like we find in basically every other truck in North America can tend to sort of skitter across broken pavement, and we don't find that in the Ridgeline. 
So when it comes to handling, I'm certainly going to give this an A+, and when it comes to ride, I'm going to give this an A. You will find a cushier ride in some full-size trucks, but as far as mid-size trucks go, you really won't find anything better than this. You also won't find too many options that are quieter than the Ridgeline. In my 50 mile an hour cabin noise test, I measured 71 decibels in here. That makes this significantly quieter than the other mid-sized trucks. And I was even surprised that when towing, again I have that trailer right there on the back, you don't get quite as much hitch rattle in the hitch as we find in some body on frame SUVs. Now there is certainly going to be some, and you will certainly hear that trailer more than in the average body on frame truck, but I am impressed that Honda managed to keep things as quiet as they did. I think that's because, of course, the hitch is way back there in the rear, and there's that bed between the cabin and the hitch. Bear in mind that this is a unibody vehicle, so the hitch, the suspension components, etc., they're all much more connected to the body of the vehicle than you'd find in a body on frame vehicle, where there's definitely a higher degree of isolation between the frame and the body. Over a few days of mixed driving, I've been averaging 22 miles per gallon in the Ridgeline, which is just above what the EPA says you should get. The Ridgeline definitely gets excellent highway fuel economy thanks to the cylinder deactivation system and the 9-speed automatic transmission. Honda has definitely tweaked this 9-speed over time. The first time that I drove this transmission in the Honda Pilot, that was the first time Honda used it, I was not the biggest fan. This is essentially the same 9-speed automatic transmission that we find in a wide variety of Jeep models and, of course, the Chrysler Pacifica minivan. This transmission has a relatively unique design to it, and as a result, there are some shifts that feel unusual, for lack of a better word. But the benefit to the 9-speed is that it has a really low starting gear, so starts from a stop are definitely going to be more aggressive, and that will help when towing heavier weights like this. And ninth gear is pretty high, helping improve highway fuel economy. The Ridgeline may not have the payload, the tow ratings, or the off-road ability that we find in other pickup trucks in America, but the Ridgeline is better at doing what pickup trucks do 98 to 99% of the time, which is commute to the office, go away for the weekend, go to Home Depot and pick up some stuff and put in the back. When you really think about the amount of time that a mid-sized pickup truck, or honestly even a full-size pickup truck, has a trailer attached to it that's over 5,000 pounds, or has over 1,000 pounds of payload in the back, it's pretty rare. If you're that kind of shopper, the Ridgeline isn't gonna be for you. But if you're the kind of person that occasionally goes to Home Depot and buys a four by eight sheet of plywood or perhaps 800 or 900 pounds of concrete, you could do that in the Ridgeline. If you plan on towing a boat or a small camper, etc., you can do that in the Ridgeline as well. But the other 99% of the time that you're in the truck, you'll have a quieter truck, a better handling truck, and a better riding truck than if you'd chosen really any of the other mid-sized trucks in America. The Ridgeline is certainly the pragmatist's pickup, but the pricing is a little bit less pragmatic perhaps than some other aspects of the vehicle. It's a little bit more expensive, well actually a lot more expensive than most of the competition base model to base model. It starts at $36,490. That's about 10 grand more than a Tacoma. Of course, there's more nuance here. We get a six-cylinder engine, not a four-cylinder engine. We get a newer transmission design than we find in the base Tacoma. We get higher payload ratings, standard all-wheel drive, etc. And versus most of the competition in this segment, the Honda Sensing System, which includes radar adaptive cruise control, is also standard on all Ridgeline models. We also get high payload rating and standard towing of 5,000 pounds. The payload rating in the Ridgeline will vary between 1,583 pounds and 1,509 pounds. That really matches the Ford Ranger as far as being the best in this segment in mainline trims. There are certain versions of the Ranger that will give you higher payload, but not when comparably equipped to the Ridgeline. Let's dive into the competition now. Obviously, the first competitor has to be the Toyota Tacoma. It starts more than $10,000 less at $26,250. But keep in mind, that's not comparably equipped. If you want the V6 engine, four-wheel drive, the five-foot bed, and the double cab to be closer in configuration to the base Ridgeline, that would end up at $35,405. Now keep in mind that Tacoma will have a traditional four-wheel drive system, as will all of the other pickup trucks in this segment. The Ridgeline is really unique in having a full-time all-wheel drive system with that torque vectoring rear axle. Remember that if you lock the transfer case in the Tacoma, the Gladiator, any of the other pickup trucks in this segment, that you should not use that system in that mode on regular dry pavement because it can actually damage the system. And if you're using that mode out on a wet, slippery road surface or even snow in some situations, you can actually lead to vehicle instability because you really need the four wheels to be able to turn at different rates. You need the front drive shaft and the rear drive shaft 
to spin at different rates in the corners. So you should never use four high, for instance, if you're on a winding mountain road and it starts to rain. That is not a time to engage four high in a traditional pickup truck. However, if you're taking a look at the ridge line, in those situations, its all-wheel drive system definitely will be an advantage. It will feel more sure-footed, it will send power front and rear and side-to-side -side across the rear axle in order to help improve vehicle stability. On the downside, the Ridgeline is never going to tow as much as the Tacoma. The Tacoma will tow up to 6,400 pounds. But I did notice the last time I got a Tacoma in for review, the low payload rating is a bit of a bummer because if you go to Home Depot and you buy uh, half a pallet of potting soil, you will end up maxing out the Tacoma's payload ability with just two passengers up front. You'll end up really on the bump stops. You won't have that same problem in the Ridgeline because the Ridgeline's payload rating is about 40 to 50 percent higher depending on exactly how you have it configured. Next up we have the Chevy Colorado. It also starts less than the Ridgeline but gets pretty similar if you've comparably equipped it. If you get the LT V6 4x4 model it'll end up at $35,595. Although the Colorado doesn't feel quite as old school as the Tacoma, keep in mind the Tacoma is getting replaced here pretty soon, the Colorado and Canyon have been around a little bit longer than you might expect. And as a result, they don't feel quite as fresh as the Ridgeline or of course the upcoming Frontier and the Gladiator. On the other hand, General Motors gives us the widest variety of engines. There's a base naturally aspirated four-cylinder engine with a six-speed automatic transmission. Then there's a V6 with an eight-speed automatic transmission and of course a 2.8 liter turbo diesel if you'd rather burn oil. If you're looking for higher tow ratings, you'll find that in the Colorado and of course the related Canyon, up to 7,000 pounds. But payload ratings won't necessarily be higher. When comparably equipped to most versions of the Ridgeline, you'll end up right around 1,200 to 1,300 pounds in the Colorado and Canyon, so a little bit lower than the Ridgeline. Again, this ends up being a question of do you plan to tow more or haul more, because hauling is actually going to be a little bit better in the Ridgeline. Keep in mind, of course, that you're going to get a better deal on the Colorado or on the Canyon on those dealer lots than on the Honda Ridgeline, so the delta between these models could end up being thousands of dollars depending on the deal that you get. Next up, we have the Ford Ranger, which leads this segment in terms of payload and in terms of towing rating. Uh, Ranger payload goes over 1,800 pounds depending on how you have it equipped, but not when comparably equipped to the Honda. It ends up being really, really close. Standard towing is 3,500 pounds, but if you have it equipped properly, you can get up to 7,500 pounds of towing capability. Now, as far as comparably equipping goes, if you get the Super Crew 4x4 version of the Ranger, then you'll end up at 1,560 pounds of payload. So depending on exactly which model of Ridgeline you're comparing it to, it could be either the same, a little bit above, or a little bit below. Ford gives us the only turbocharged gasoline engine in this segment. It's their ubiquitous 2.3 liter turbo that they use in a wide variety of different models and the same 10 speed automatic transmission that we find behind the F-150's engine lineup. The big thing with this engine is that it produces an awful lot of torque, 310 pound feet. So if you're planning on towing 5,000 to 6,000 pounds or more in your pickup truck, the Ranger is going to be quite simply the best option to tow with. Not just because of that torque, but also because of the 10-speed automatic transmission. It really has a gear ratio for every situation. Now let's talk about where the Ridgeline excels and where you might want to choose one of the other competitors. For the average suburban weekend warrior, honestly, the Ridgeline is really, really good because it's a lot better to drive in your daily commute. It's going to be better to drive in slipperier situations. So if you're the kind of person that likes to go skiing or snowboarding, things like that, and you want a pickup truck, it's going to be an awful lot more sure-footed in those adverse winter weather situations. Now, if you wanted to go more off the beaten path, if you want to go rock climbing, uh, rock crawling rather, in your pickup truck, if you want to lift your pickup truck, do a lot of those aftermarket modifications that you see so often in Tacomas especially, the Tacoma is going to be a better option. Not only are there more options available, it's simply going to be less expensive and easier to lift a vehicle that is designed like a Tacoma, a Colorado, a Canyon, etc., than something that is designed like the Ridgeline. It's just a mechanical thing. If you're buying a pickup truck mainly because of the bed, then the Ridgeline has one of the biggest beds in this segment, and it also has one of the highest payload ratings. So theoretically, you could get a Ranger with a higher bed capacity, but comparably equipped, the Ridgeline is going to be pretty similar to most versions of the Ranger. But it's not going to have a bed that is as wide, so it's not going to be able to accommodate some of those wider sheets of goods, and it's not going to have that under bed cargo storage area. Now on the downside, we don't get a full size spare tire. I think that's a bit of a pity in the Ridgeline, but the bed practicality is going to make this the choice for someone that doesn't really need to tow, but wants to be able to go to Home Depot and get 16 to 20 bags of concrete, or say you just want to fill the bed up with potting soil. It's going to be able to do that an awful lot better than the Tacoma. When it comes to towing, it really depends on what you plan to tow. An Airstream Bambi, for instance, will be just fine. It's about 3,000 pounds for a $51,000 trailer. The average Jayco 20 to 22 foot travel trailer is going to be just fine as well. Uh, a new ski boat, 
that's gonna be a little bit heavy. Most new ski boats seem to be over 5,000 pounds without the trailer, so that is definitely going to be an area where you might wanna choose something like a Ford Ranger. But for jet skis and a trailer, that would be just fine. A snazzy freshwater fishing boat, just fine as well. Taking your lawn tractor in for service, maybe two side-by-sides out to the local state park, two ATVs somewhere, that will be just fine. Horses, one or two horses should be just fine as long as they're not super fat Clydesdales or anything. That would definitely be within the tow rating of the Ranger. And remember that if you're thinking about towing animals and you want to carry animal feed around in the bed of your truck, none of these vehicles might be the best fit for you. If you want to be able to put a few hundred pounds in the bed and hitch up a 5,000 pound trailer, you might want to take a look at something like a three quarter ton pickup truck, to be honest, because remember that tongue weight comes out of the payload ability of the vehicle. So if you have a 5,000 pound trailer on the back and you put 500 pounds of tongue weight onto your truck, you've got a thousand pounds left to play with in the ridgeline. Now, on the other hand, that is more than you would get in a Tacoma. So keep that in mind as well. If for instance, you have a 5,000 pound trailer on the back of a Tacoma or a Colorado or a Canyon, you're gonna end up with less available payload than you'll find in a Ridgeline. Now, as much as I love the Ridgeline, in my particular situation, it just doesn't tow enough for me. I really do need to tow over 7,000 pounds, which is why I'm looking at a vehicle that can tow between eight and 9,000 pounds. My heavy equipment trailer is 3,500 pounds in its own right. If I put a 4,000 pound excavator on it, which is a very small excavator, mind you, then you are over the tow limit of really anything in this segment, period. And obviously, if you're looking to overland with some sort of overland travel trailer, you might want to take a look at a vehicle that has a true locking two-speed transfer case in the center, big knobbly tires, off-road, so you can match that with your off-road travel trailer, etc. That's not going to be where the ridgeline is. But for the average family that is doing average family things, commuting daily in the vehicle, going to Home Depot on the weekends, maybe occasionally taking your fishing boat out to the lake, taking your ATVs or your side-by-sides here or there, taking your garden tractor in for service, the Ridgeline is really an ideal vehicle for this situation. The high payload rating especially is really, really handy. Be sure and let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. I've always wondered why we don't find more pickup trucks like this in America. We are going to see the new Santa Cruz coming from Hyundai, but it's designed to be a step smaller than the Ridgeline, and we really don't have anything that's a step larger than the Ridgeline. We used to have the Avalanche, of course, from Chevrolet. We just don't have that option anymore in the United States. I really, really loved the format of the Avalanche, but oddly enough, it didn't really sell well, according to General Motors. I actually thought it sold better than I expected, but according to GM, the sales weren't where they wanted it to be, and that's why it got whacked. Be sure and let me know what you think about that in the comments section. Find me over at facebook.com slash so you can see what I'm driving this week, over at Instagram, all those other social places, and of course, at the merch store, where you can buy merch like the shirt that I'm wearing right now. I'll see all of you later.